And I guess I need to explain the reason I'm here. You know, I don't really, really want to be here, but Ms. Dominique is going to talk after I'm done, and she has a phenomenal story. I told her that I would lead by example, which is the NCO creed. And I was the oldest of 17 kids, for those who haven't heard this story. And I bounced around in orphanages and foster homes my entire childhood until about nine when I was told that I was lucky because I was going to be adopted. <clears throat> the gentleman's name was Tom. He was a family man. He was married, kindergarten teacher, Cub Scout master, a youth minister, and yes, a pedophile. So from the age of about nine to 15, I went from what was a difficult life to a downright hell. Because I'd never had a father before, so I had no idea what that kind of affection was. And things started small. You know, when you're peeing and somebody comes and pees beside you, it's not a real big deal. And when he reaches out to grab it and help you pee, you might know something is wrong. But by the time I was realizing something was wrong, it stopped being any pretenses of affection. It was all just a form of punishment. After the physical abuse will come the sexual abuse for the slightest mistake. I'm not, I can't sit here and describe to you the pain of being beaten, sodomized, and molested for years. I don't want to close the door and make it so you can pretend it wasn't there because I live with it every day. Can't really, no need to provide gruesome details because there's nothing I can say that's going to provide clarity for anyone who's not experienced this humiliation. But I can try to explain why this is important and why the civil suit may be necessary. So we'll start with damages because, you know, you can't subject a child to this kind of horror and expect them to not be scarred. The dehumanization, the victimization has an impact and it's lasting. If you're a little man, growing up, you want to have your masculinity. There's only two ways to prove that, violence and womanizing. Thank God for the military because the violent part I was able to get out of the way. Self-medication, do lots of drinking, and for me, adrenaline. Combat, fighting, volunteering for everything I could. In fact, it's beyond adrenaline rush. It was suicidal, but not really in that way because I would never take my own life. But it was reckless enough because I wanted to die. At least my death would have value since my life was worthless. But time and time again, those bullets missed me. So I ended up by 25, after all my attempts at dealing with my problems, disconnected. Because see, when people turn a blind eye towards you, pretend it's not happening, or the people that you really trusted, or that they put there for you to trust, violate everything in your very soul, you have to let it go. Trust becomes inimical to your existence. I've been married three times. Friends, it's not really a thing for me because I create that called healthy distance. Jobs, man, I've been fired from every job I can think of. I've lost rank so many times, I have an attitude phenomenal out of this world. Most of all for me, sleep. I don't sleep. I sleep two or three hours a night if I'm lucky because my mind doesn't want to go there because if it relaxes, then, then the walls come down and the shields come down and I'm left with just me. And that, I can't do that. And the temper, and the anger, and the violence, and the incessant, right below the surface, volatility. See, these are my damages. The demons are right below the surface because, and they're raiding like every day to find a breach in my armor. There's no amount of counseling or talking that's going to bring me back to normal. I know that. It's not going to undo what happened. Because the scars, they run too deep, and the devastation is much too complete. And there are many more just like me, and many, many more much worse than I am. I know that when I think, I can't go on my reactions. I have to tell myself, is that what a normal person would do? Because I know what I do would not be normal. Every morning I get up and it's the same routine for the last 25 years. I, I look at myself in the mirror and I say whatever curse words come to mind about how crappy I look. And I look at all the scars on my face. My eyes, my head, where hair doesn't grow, and the deeper ones in my soul. And I splash water on my face, and I say, you know what? <sighs> Today's going to be a good day. See, I'm, I'm so used to plodding forward, I'm not smart enough to really give up. And in my mind, I keep waiting for that morning to come, to lead me out of the darkness. But I, I tell you, at this time, I don't think I would even recognize a sunny day if I saw it. This is not a poor me story. I'm not here for pity, because I really don't need it. I'm fine by myself. I've been by myself my whole life. I just wanted to put you in my shoes for a minute, just to a small degree, so you understand why this bill is important to some of us. 
All 25 is just not enough. Put a little face on the damage that the pedophiles cause because it's lasting. It's my fear that, again, this bill is going to die a quiet death. That the church is going to come in and say this is an attack on them and they can't afford it. I guess I'll still pay for it, though. Because I wasn't, wasn't about a church for me. In fact, at this hearing, many of you may, you know, look at me and think of me differently. This is not a proud moment in my life. It's quite embarrassing. But I told this young lady that I would lead by example and I would tell my story so she could tell hers. I know what I am inside. I deal with it every day, all the time. I try to contain it and control it, but it's there. And all I ask is you please don't continue to protect the monsters like the ones that created this monster. Thank you, Delegate.